Sarah Lauderman. I'm the program director at Global Ties KC. Um, and I am just so filled with joy right now seeing all the people in this room. I mean, there's nothing better than a packed room, right? Like, almost not too many seats. So um, thank you for joining us this evening with beautiful weather. Um, we've had an amazing year, um, and we're really excited to share all of the work we put in with all of you this evening. Um, just a reminder, we hope that you're all following us on social media. We have a lot of really great ideas and really great plans, and social media is part of it. So make sure you're tagging us at any point. Um, any photos you take tonight, we'd love to have them. Um, but really, we're excited that you're all here. You're a part of our community. You're the ones who are kind of closest to us and make this work possible. So coming together in the seating in the round is really special. So um, we're glad you're a part of it. Um, but with that, though, I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into it. I'm going to welcome our board president up to speak a little bit more before we welcome our president and CEO, Courtney Brooks. So, Shabina, come on down. Do you want to come on down? Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, you know, I didn't want to say it, but I do want to mention last week our city went through something so profound, so devastating. But again, what get, helps us get over it is this, to come together, um, to be with each other, to sit at the table and enjoy everyone's company and have dinner together. So I'm so glad we were able to do this. Um, with the same thing, before I have Courtney come up here, um, I, over the years, have become a firm believer of this, that everything we do, every organization's work, or every task we do has a science and an art to it. Uh, science, of course, is our program manuals, our organizational structure, and all of that. And the art is exactly this, what's happening right here. Art is the collaboration. Art is the bringing people together. Art is having coffee together. And that's where I feel like Global Ties accepts the art of bringing people together, art of international collaboration. And the heart and soul of that, of course, is Courtney Brooks. Um, Courtney, along with her team, has brought this organization to a place where I was reading uh, a volunteer-led organization to a place where we have collaborations with countries across. We have 438 or something individuals who came across paths, came across. Uh, Courtney's going to tell the, the truth. <laughs> uh, maybe numbers up here. Uh, but what a joy, what a joy to have somebody like Courtney be uh, front and center, be the leader, be the heart and soul, be the art of uh, the one who puts art into this organization. So. Um, I'm so glad and I'm so pleased to be working with an amazing board. Uh, board members, if you can just raise your hand or just stand up so we can give you a round of applause. Uh, we have an amazing board. And with that, Courtney, your team is amazing and you are it. <laughs> And as Sarah said, we hope you're following us on social media. Um, if at some point tonight you want to scan this QR code or go to our LinkedIn page and comment and say, I am here, this is what I care about when it comes to international exchange work and why I celebrate Global Ties KC. We would love to have everyone in this room participating in those ways. As we are building out our community recognition um, for some very strategic ways and things that we are going to be talking about as we go. So Global Ties KC, we've been building international relationships since 1954. So if you do that math on that, that means that this year we are celebrating our 70th anniversary as an organization. For those of you who may or may not know, it was actually a organization in 1954, as I said, started by 23 supporting members who came together with this committee and this idea to support international students they formally organized this group in 1954, but it was actually in 1952 where we started our first programming. And by 1955, this organization that has grown to what it Global Ties KC is today had already arranged home hospitality meals for over a thousand international visitors and students in our community. 
1964, we had grown to become what was then known as CEVAS, the Committee of International Visitors. And in the years that followed, we changed our name again to the Kansas City International Visitors Council. Global Ties K3C, through this time period as an organization, has always embraced this idea of citizen diplomacy, of average folks, you and I, who get to serve as connectors and bridge builders and to build community between our international peers who become friends through our programs. And the idea is that you, through your participation in our activities, get to shape foreign relations one handshake at a time. Our mission has also grown in the last few years to include this idea and concept of how do we foster a generation of future leaders who are involved in sustainable international relationships and have a place at the table to be a part of important global conversations. And in the last few years as well, one of the ideas that we keep coming back to as a team, as a board, as a community, is this vision of a heartland where every single person has the opportunity to have a global experience right from their own backyard. So through this growth, through this trajectory as an organization, one of the things that I did early in my tenure as executive director was switch our name from the International Visitors Council of Global Ties KC to what we are known as now as Global Ties KC. Um, Bernard and Sharon are in the room, are some of our board members who were actually a part of those conversations at that time. As we said, how do we move from being this hidden gem in the Kansas City community to a well-known nonprofit organization? Back around that same time period, this is what our budget looked like. So back in 2012, we operated on about $180,000 a year as a small independent nonprofit organization. Of that though, about 98% of our funding came from federal grants. Can anyone in this room tell me why that number and that idea might be problematic? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out answers. Politics. Politics? <laughs> yep, things change. What else? We lost a main grant. We lost a main grant. Yep, what happens if a grant goes? How much we're dependent on single source incomes? What else? Local economics. Local economics, yep. And then the other big idea is this. So those of you who don't know, the US federal budget allocates less than 1% to support international affairs. So we're not just talking about Department of State and all of our embassies across the world, it's also USAID, economic development, NAFTA, NATO, exchanges. All of those things are less than 1% of our budget. And the portfolio or the group that we pull from is less than 0.018% of the international affairs budget to support international exchange programs. Which means that when we were looking at that time to federal grants as our sole source of income, it's a very limited pool. Moreover, one of the things that exists within this, this federal grant community, within the exchange space specifically, is the idea that we as a local community should be cost sharing at least 50% of what it takes to run exchange programs. So thinking back to that slide in 98% of the budget, yes, we were doing all of our programs for about 180,000 a year, but that involved lots and lots of extra volunteer time and underpaying the team and resources that just didn't exist for us as an organization. So over the last decade, that's been one of our biggest attempts is how do we grow our local support and how do we move from that spot of full dependence on the federal government, especially knowing that things change from year to year and that there's been no funding increases for any of our federal grants in the last decade. How do we as a community step forward and say we care about these programs, we care about creating these opportunities, how do we do it locally and with folks like you all in the room tonight? So at that time, one of the things that I got to do in preparing for this presentation was digging through some old files. And if you'll indulge me in this a bit, one of the documents I found was from 2014. So at that time, I served as the executive director. I also, over the course of that year, had three different program associates. Not at the same time, not like where we are today. I had one in the fall who left, and then one in the spring who left for a PhD program. A four month gap where I was just doing things on my own, and then someone else who started in the summer. 
That was also the year that I asked one of my high school student turned college freshman intern, Sarah Martin, if she would please, please, please come work for me 10 hours a week as a program assistant. Sarah, who you met, who has been with me ever since. <laughs> we hosted almost 30 international visitor leadership program projects, which met visitors from 78 different countries. I also did three open world programs, visitors from Kazakhstan, Russia, and Ukraine who lived with host families for a week. We did a Pakistan Emerging Leaders program, students from Pakistan that lived with host families for a weekend. Three youth exchange student programs from Argentina and Chile, Ecuador and Peru, and Mexico, students that lived with host families for two weeks. A year-long program for students from Kosovo who lived with families for a year. We did a lot. But like I said, that's 10 years ago, so that was off the year we went through a rebrand. So did all of the rebranding from the Kansas City International Visitors Council to Global Ties KC. It was the first year we ever had a database. We were also focused on community outreach and going from this idea of like hidden gem to we should be known in the community. It was a lot. <laughs> there was also the week, the year, the time period, those years surrounding 2012 to 2018, where I was really, really good friends with all of the cleaning crew that came into Union Station every night, because that's when I was seeing them. And also the year that I stopped counting my hours because I worked or was on call 18 weekends in a row throughout that spring and summer. By comparison, this is where we are today. Um, I have a team of 10 at the moment, so myself. Sarah, who you met. Matt, Justin, and Neity, who have been with me full time the last couple of years, working on different program portfolios that we'll talk about in a bit. Martina, who is working on our social media and marketing and media. Ella, who is our Youth Diplomat Fellow. Claire and Abigail, who are IVLP fellows for this spring. Let me click a button. Um, as well as Eduardo, who just started with us a couple of weeks ago, working on um, all of our outreach as our Director of External Affairs. Also in 2023, our economic impact was almost $2 million. That includes around an $850,000 organization budget as well as the economic impact of the groups that came to town through hotels and transportation, meals and incidentals, and also the cost share and the impact and the volunteer contribution of the local community. Exchange programs aren't just this drop in the bucket, we are making a real difference in the community with the work that we are doing. Last year we had 493 participants who were close to Vina on 35 different exchange programs. Last year, we also hosted a Diplomacy Begins Here Summit on shaping foreign policy from the heartland. This was a two-day conference in the fall where we spent a day at the Truman Presidential Library, as well as a day over the Kauffman Foundation where we had around 80 friends from across the Global Ties Network who came to town to talk best practices and ways that we as a national community can do a better job in implementing our programs. And also just really highlighting to our friends in DC that foreign policy decisions don't just happen in Washington, DC. That not only today, but historically, Kansas City and the Heartland have always played a very significant role in affecting foreign policy. These were our numbers from last year, um, or our countries rather. Not only did these visitors have an impact during their time in Kansas City, they all went back home to their home countries across the world and took the knowledge that they gained here and the relationships that they gained during their time in Kansas City and they took their experience here back home to implement changes in their own communities around the world. So like I said, looking back a decade, this is kind of where we started the International Visitor Leadership Program, Professional Exchanges and Youth Exchanges. We've moved into education and more community events, the Youth Diplomats Institute, and STEM and virtual programs, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then looking forward, we're continuing to think about our regional impact and then outbound programming, which I'm excited to talk about and share an update on shortly. The International Visitor <coughs> Leadership Program, though, is kind of the core of who we are or have been as an organization. 
And this is one of the Department of State's go-to exchange <coughs> programs to help implement our impact, our foreign policy, and big picture goals that we are looking at as a nation. And my question to you all is why? So what, why does it matter that we are tying in local issues and having conversations with an international audience? And what are the things that you care about that have a local impact but also affect us globally? Shout it out. What are issues that we can better address on a global scale? Sustainability. Sustainability. Culture. Human rights. Culture, human rights. Food security. Food security, great one. Literacy. Literacy, <laughs> yep. There, there, the reality is, like, name an issue, and if there's a group of people in one community that are trying to find a solution, there's probably people in dozens and thousands of other communities that are also trying to find those solutions. And global challenges require global solutions. So one of the things that we do with the International Visitor Leadership Program and the rest of the exchanges that we work on as an organization for this program specifically, the International Visitor Leadership Program, or IVLP, our embassies across the world go out and they handpick leaders who are working to address these global challenges and invite them to the United States. So in a given year, we have individuals who are coming into Kansas City to talk about food insecurity, human rights, democracy, safety, rule of law, education, name a topic, anything other than maritime law, and we do it in Kansas City. And the reason that the Department of State and the federal government is invested in these programs is because we can make a difference in all of these areas, but it also helps us with prosperity as a nation and our values as a country, being able to talk about things like human rights and democracy, as well as our security, as we've seen with everything going on in Ukraine, especially at the moment. It matters that we have friends from around the world. It matters that we have these relationships. So the IVLP program, like I said, has been around for around 80 years. In that time, over 200,000 visitors have come to the United States, which includes over 500 current or former heads of state. About a third of acting heads of state have been to the United States earlier in their careers on this program. So our embassies do a really, really amazing job of going out and handpicking people who are making a difference and are even more so have, have the path and the trajectory and are going to make a bigger difference later in life. And instead of just bringing them to Washington, D.C. and saying, hey, this is what the federal government looks like, they bring them across the United States and they drop them off in our, th in our communities and we have the opportunity to host these leaders and to have real heart-to-heart -heart living room conversations about what life is like here in the heartland. These are programs so far this year. Um, it's not a short list. In the last couple of months, or the last month and a half, we've had visitors here on programs looking at libraries, trafficking in persons, AI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is just the start of the year. The rest of this calendar is gonna look a little bit like this. Um, so definitely keep an eye on things that are coming up. The two lines that are bold are the groups that we're still looking for home hospitality hosts for. So for our International Visitor Leadership Program participants, they stay in hotels and have professional meetings around town, and then we ask you, the community, who wants to have someone over for dinner? And it doesn't have to be a big, formal, fancy meal. Some of my favorite meals that I've hosted are sitting on the back patio where we cook some hamburgers and eat some ice cream. And the rest of our program portfolio are professional and youth exchanges. Um, Open World we're still doing. We just had a delegation from Ukraine who were in town a few weeks ago. Next month, we have a group of 14 fellows from across Latin America on the Young Leaders of the America Initiative. We're going to be in fellowship placements for a month. As well as Community Connections, this is one of our longest standing programs we've been working on for almost 20 years. It started in the former Soviet Union region as the idea of how do we build democracy and relationships. I talked about Last year at this event, one of the gentlemen who had come on a community connections program and spent a month living in Kansas City went on to serve as the Secretary of Interior for in Ukraine. Um, but the program right now, it's, it's disappeared from almost every country except <coughs> Belarus. Um, we still have participants from Belarus who are taking part in this. 
Um, Michael Farmer, sitting up there, went and met with a group of them last year, has been involved in that program, and we will have a group of Belarusians participating virtually again later this spring in that program. We also have a TESOL program coming up, so um, teaching English as a second language, and we'll be looking for home hospitality dinner hosts for that group as well. And for that wildlife fellowship program from Latin America, we're looking for cultural ambassadors um, for later the, through March and into April, folks that want to meet with these young leaders and invite them into your home once a week or to go out to the ballet or whatever you want to do with them um, for them to have an extra touch point while they're in Kansas City and another individual or family that wants to kind of adopt them into your home for their time in Kansas City. Youth programs I mentioned earlier, um, this has always been my heart is our, our youth exchanges and I keep hiring people who are, are just as passionate about it because we continue to grow into our youth programming areas. We have five youth exchange programs this spring, which means I have 104 students that need host families this year. So if you want to host someone in your home for a program, you're welcome to. <laughs> if you want to host someone in your home for two programs, you're welcome to. And if you want to leave here tonight and talk to your neighbors and your pastor and every other community organization you're involved with and say, hey, there's this really cool organization, they have youth that are coming to town, you want to host someone, please, please, please um, tell everyone because that's our biggest bottleneck right now is this need to find host families for these students who are coming in over this year. So our first program is going to be April. We have a group of students from across Africa. We also have a program from Africa this summer, as well as in June, a group of high school girls from Nepal who are looking at STEM. And then another STEM-focused program in July, girls from Albania, Greece, Kosovo, Montenegro, Turkey, and the US. And then this fall in October, um, very exciting. One of the biggest ways that we have grown as an organization is that this will be our second year working directly with the U.S. Embassy in Paris to host the French Community Exchange Program. So we have 30 students from France that we are planning their full itinerary flights, travel, D.C., and working with a partner in Pensacola who will host part of that group, and then the rest will be in Kansas City. So, like I said, tell everyone you know, host a student. We'd love to have you a part of that program in that way. Education and learning, like I mentioned, as we've kind of grown as an organization, has been a real priority. Uh, for people who don't have space in your home, or aren't really keen on cooking, or aren't sure how to, to get involved in those ways that still want to meet with our groups, how do we create as many opportunities as possible for people to have the chance to interface with our international visitors that are coming to town? And so one of the big ways we've done this is expanding our cultural connection hours. We had 18 community events last year. And the goal is to have even more in 2024. Last week, we had a delegation from Zimbabwe who were part of a panel discussion talking about AI and human rights. Um, definitely keep an eye on upcoming programs. There will be plenty this spring. And if you are someone you know has an event space and wants to be a partner and host, always looking for extra opportunities to bring in new audiences to meet with our visiting groups through these cultural hours. We also are looking ahead to May 9th, save the date if it is not already saved on your calendar for our annual Heartland pop-up fundraiser and celebration. We will be at Union Station this year out in Haverty Yard out back. Um, for anyone who's been in the past, our goal with these programs is always to have as much fun as possible. Um, so food, drinks, live music, and a really casual atmosphere and a chance to come in and celebrate the organization and specifically to support our Youth Diplomats Institute. I mentioned STEM and virtual, and I know it's something that folks get really excited about, myself included, because it's one of our other new big pieces of our program portfolio. We are a quarter of the way through a two-year grant through the Stevens Initiative. By the end of it, we will have 600 students from Kansas City, Morocco, and Libya who are participating in a virtual exchange program. So we are working with FIRST Robotics partners in these three countries and students who are part of the FIRST program, building robots and taking part in these team activities who are joining us as parts of their teams for this virtual exchange program. 
I will say Matt and I had a chance to go to Morocco a few weeks ago to meet our partners and the students there. And it was such a moving experience to be walking down the hall and have students flagging and be like, Matt, what are you doing here? Like, what? <laughs> and students who recognized us through this virtual on-screen experience who were so, so grateful. Because the reality is that for our program partners in Morocco and Libya, more than half of our students who are participating through the funding that we're we were able to secure through this program are able to participate in FIRST programs who would not be a part of those, those programs otherwise. Not just the virtual exchange piece, but any of the FIRST activities. And so that is really, really exciting to see that and what it's going to look like long term as we're investing in this groups of middle and high school students and career readiness in STEM education. Regional impact is another thing that we've talked a lot about as an organization in the last few years, and it's something that we are always brainstorming on. So Global Ties KC is based in Kansas City. We do a lot of work with the greater Kansas City metro region, but also when it comes to the International Visitor Leadership Program, we are the implementing partner for the Department of State for the entire state of Kansas and the entire western half of Missouri. Which means that in addition to bringing these international opportunities to the Kansas City community, it is, it is my personal heart and passion of how we bring these experiences to as many small towns as possible. Because I believe, and I hope most of you also believe, that every single person in the heartland should have the opportunity to have a global experience if that is something that they want in their life. Everyone should have the opportunity to travel and have experiences meeting with international visitors if that is something that they want to be a part of. And so one of the, the surprising ways that this has become a reality for us as an organization is through the Youth Diplomats Institute. The Youth Diplomats Institute started as a passion program project about five years ago. Sarah and I said, how do we have a bigger impact on high school students in the community? We started with a full day retreat and then built out a year long in an institute whereby our high school students join us from August through May. They get together one Saturday a month. Every time we have an international visitor program when they're meeting, we bring them in to have lunch with our students and to talk about their experience, resume building, networking. If anyone ever wants to sit down with our students and share your life experiences, we're always looking for ways to expose the young folks in this program to the world and to the international and global opportunities that are out there, but also the local opportunities. When we started this program, I thought all of our students would say, like, oh, I'm going to go join the Department of State. That's what I want to do. And we've, we've had a couple of students who that's their vision, but the rest of them want to be doctors or lawyers or not go to school and just go work on a cruise ship or <laughs> work in marketing. Like, they're all across the board. And it has been so amazing to be able to say, it doesn't matter what career you're going into, like, the world is global and to be able to, to present them with the opportunities to be a part of these types of programs. And like I said, back to that regional influence, one of the, the best things that came out of the pandemic when everything shut down and we said, oh my God, we can't meet in person. What are we supposed to do with high school students? We can't be in person. So we moved everything online. And in moving everything online, we realized, oh, our students don't have to be able to drive down to Union Station. They don't have to be in Kansas City. They can be anywhere across the region. So one of our biggest goals and things we're most excited about with that program the last couple of years and moving forward is expanding it regionally. Um, my, my heart of hearts and my dream is that in the next few years I'll have a group of 30 students from Hutchinson, Kansas who are going to all want to participate in the program. But until we can scale to that point, how do we find that one student from that one small town who wants to have an international experience and inviting them into the program? From day one, it's been super, super important to us that it is completely free for all student participants. So there is no cost for our students to participate in the program, but there's also no cost for our students who are selected for travel opportunities. And so in the last couple of years, we've taken students to Washington, D.C. a couple times. We took a group of students to Chicago, and the dream for the next couple of years is how we take students to Central America or Europe or elsewhere, and how do we fund outbound exchange opportunities for our high school students to be able to travel. Which brings me to my next slide, which is outbound travel. <laughs> Youth diplomats is certainly one of the areas where we're hoping to make this happen. 
But over the years, one of the things that we always keep going back to is we bring these amazing international visitors in the community. We connect them to you all. We build relationships. But how do we facilitate the second part of that to make it a true two-way exchange? So I'm really excited to announce tonight the funding of a new fund through Global Ties KC. It's going to be the KC Cultural Outbound Fund. Um, if you want to write us a $10,000 check at the end of the evening, put that on, on the subject line. Um, we are seeding this fund with the goal of it being something that we can carry forward into the future. We're starting with three local artists who are going to the biennial in Dakar in Senegal. It is a large art festival, and by large I mean the largest art festival in Africa that happens every other year. John Rowe, who is a painter. Melissa Ferrer, who is Casey's first poet laureate. I don't know if you've heard the news that was just announced last week. As well as Calvin Arsenia, who is a harp player. Um, there's a small harp that's very similar to what he works with that's from Senegal that he's hoping to, to learn how to use while he is there. Um, but we're sending the three of them to Senegal in May. Um, we're gonna be a financial sponsor and help them with this outbound program and see where it goes from there. So we, we really don't know as a pilot program what it's going to turn into. The goal and the dream is that we're able to figure out funding streams long term to make this a big core of what we do is supporting folks from Kansas City who have the opportunity to go to go out. Um, so we are looking at that fund only funding and supporting educators, artists, and community builders who would not otherwise have the chance to take part in some international travel. So that is one of the next next big things we are looking at as an organization. Um, if you saw the dip jar back by the piano, we're using tonight as a chance to seed fund that program and see if we get you know folks who can't quite figure out whether the, the ding means it worked and they want to just you know keep 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 dinging it. <laughs> um, you're welcome to go play with the dip jar once we're done here. But that's that's kind of the next goal for for that program and for what we're doing with outbound programming as an organization. I also mentioned this is our 70th anniversary, 2024. Um, I am really, really excited. Next week, the end of next week, we will be launching our 70 Stories for 70 Years campaign. Behind the scenes, in the office, with all of the spare time that we have had as a team between programs the last few months, one of the things that we've been looking at is our archives and going and digging in through our past archives to figure out who's been to Kansas City in the past and what they're doing now. And so we will be releasing a couple of stories every week through the fall, looking at the impact of Global Ties KC programs throughout the year. So check that out, um, and we look forward to celebrating our 70th anniversary at the event this, this May. As always, we need you. Um, yes, serve as a host family. Yes, make a donation. But also tell people about your time here tonight, tell people about why you support and care about this organization, um, and help us make, make Kansas City even more global than we already are. So, that's what I got for tonight.